the United States and the coalition lost. Dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of personnel. The Taiwanese economy is wrecked, uh, and the U.S. global position would be affected for many years. This is a conversation with Mark Gantian. Mark is a former United States Marine Corps colonel who served in Vietnam, Operation Desert Storm, and the Iraq War. And later, as a scholar, he worked and taught at Harvard and the John Hopkins University. And today, he works as a senior advisor at the Washington Center for Strategic and International Studies. But the reason we talked today was because Mark was one of the leads on an incredibly interesting project that took place last year. The largest and most complex publicly available war game simulating a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Using an incredible amount of data, large number of players, and 25 different scenarios, Mark and his colleagues simulated what would happen if China attacked Taiwan. And in this conversation, we talked about how the invasion would actually go down what would be the result, whether the United States military is ready for it, and how to prevent it from escalating into a larger global conflict. You can find the report with the detailed information about the war game in the description below. And now, enjoy the podcast. So I'd like to talk about the, the, the war game that you did and that you've um, published the report on um, in January of last year. But just to start, if you could just sort of introduce the basic scenario that you were working with in the war game and what were the main results that uh, you have seen before we go into the further details. We developed a war game that simulated a conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan. We ran 25 iterations in about a dozen different scenarios. We did have a base scenario, which we considered the most likely we look at a variety of alternatives because we recognized that there were many assumptions about which uh, you could have uh, alternatives. The results of the war game were that the United States and its coalition could sustain a autonomous and democratic Taiwan, but it came at very high cost. The United States and the coalition lost dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of personnel. The Taiwanese economy is wrecked, uh, and the U.S. global position would be affected for uh, many years. It's important to note also that the Chinese lost heavily, and the scale of their losses might endanger the stability of the Chinese Communist Party. Could you describe in a little bit more detail how the invasion would actually unfold um, based on, on the war game that you had in, in the base scenario from basically the Chinese preemptive attack, the involvement of allies in the region, um, and sort of what would happen step by step. Every game was different, but there was a certain pattern that emerged. The Chinese landed in the south, uh, not the north. The North, of course, has the capital and many of the large cities and much of the industry, but the Taiwanese have most of their combat power in the North. So the Chinese uh, tended to land in the South where it was easier to get ashore. A couple of times the Chinese player tried to land in the North, it was very difficult uh, to establish themselves. So they land in the South and then they try to build up combat capability there. The Chinese fleet divides into two pieces. One piece escorts the amphibious ships uh, from the mainland uh, to Taiwan to land the, the troops. The bulk of the fleet forms a picket line to the east of Taiwan to protect the amphibious ships from attack by U.S. aircraft and cruise missiles. The amphibious ships are the center of gravity, the key element, because if they get destroyed, then regardless of what other capabilities the Chinese have, they cannot get forces onto Taiwan and they lose. So the, they work hard to protect those amphibious ships and the U.S. player and coalition work hard to get at those amphibious ships. I mentioned earlier that the assumption on Japan was that they would let the U.S. use its bases but would not participate themselves unless the Chinese attacked Japanese territory. In about 20 games out of the 25, uh, the Chinese did do that. 
what they found was that the U.S. was building combat power on its bases, and those were operating with impunity. And at some point, they decided to attack those bases. When they did, they destroyed a lot of aircraft on the ground, but they also figured that if they were going to attack the United States and bring the Japanese into the conflict, they might as well attack the Japanese also. So the Chinese typically attack the United States and Japanese forces at the same time in a massive missile attack. It's interesting to note that this received a tremendous amount of attention in Japan. Uh, the game, for example, spawned a one-hour TV special uh, as the Japanese discussed it and analyzed it. And the reason it got so much attention was that it showed that the decision about war and peace for Japan was going to be made in Beijing and Washington, not in Tokyo. That the Japanese would be brought into the war based on what the Chinese decided and the United States decided. And that was quite a shock. They had assumed that they would have the choice whether to uh, enter the conflict or not. Typical games also uh, entailed a lot of U.S. aircraft losses on the ground. The reason was that the Chinese have a lot of missiles, but the United States needs to move its aircraft in close if they're going to strike at the Chinese fleet and fly over uh, Taiwan. So what happens is you have successive waves of U.S. fighter attack aircraft going forward, uh, being destroyed by Chinese missiles, more aircraft going forward. The games were typically a race between uh, U.S. efforts to destroy Chinese amphibious ships and the Chinese efforts to land forces on the island and take over a port or airfield to bring in more forces. Uh, they typically lost that race because the United States was able to get at its, uh, the Chinese amphibious ships, but that came at very high cost as they kept on pushing f more fighter aircraft forward and these fighter aircraft kept uh, being destroyed on, on the ground. One of the recommendations that we make is that the United States and Japan build more hardened shelters and expand their capability for distributed operations to reduce the vulnerability of these aircraft. But the Chinese are able to um, land at least some forces uh, in Taiwan. The Chinese are always able to land some forces on Taiwan. Their, their uh, military capabilities at this point are such that the Taiwanese cannot defeat them in the straits. Now, that has been their strategy for 70 years. And for a long time, it was a reasonable strategy. Uh, and it's still reasonable to be able to strike the uh, Chinese in the straits, but they have too much combat power now uh, to be uh, completely defeated before uh, they land. It's worth noting two other aspects of uh, the games that ran through all of the iterations. One was the value of U.S. submarines. Uh, they would move into the straits and wreak havoc on the Chinese fleet. Uh, we called it the happy time for U.S. submarines. The problem was there just weren't enough of them. Uh, they would expend all of their munitions and they would have to go back and, and reload. The other thing was how useful bombers armed with long-range cruise, cruise missiles were. They could be based outside of the Chinese defensive bubble. They could launch their missiles uh, before they got inside Chinese air defenses, and those missiles then would uh, attack the Chinese fleet. The problem the U.S. had was that its inventory of anti-ship cruise missiles is very small and was expended in the first couple of days. One of the major recommendations, and something the Pentagon has picked up on, is the need to expand those inventories. And then the game basically ends with most of the Chinese Navy eventually being destroyed. And the forces that were able to land on Taiwan are then eliminated and China is not able to bring further reinforcements. Is that, and that basically concludes the war game and the conflict. Uh, yes. Now, now, when we finish the play at about three or four weeks, the Chinese are still ashore in Taiwan. Uh, 
Their problem is that they have lost so many amphibious ships that they cannot expand their forces and are having difficulty sustaining them. So as we project ahead, it's clear that those forces would eventually be uh, defeated and destroyed. And that's one of the reasons that we raise the question about the stability of the Chinese Communist Party if they suffer such a defeat. The, they would see thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Chinese prisoners on Taiwan being paraded through the streets of Taipei, and it's not clear they could uh, sustain that kind of international humili humiliation. So when I read the um, um, war game report back in, in January when it came out, I have to say that it was quite surprising um, for me, um, the result that basically said that as long as the United States would enter the conflict, the odds of the Chinese victory would be extremely low. And I think that um, it's ex quite surprising given the news reports we have um, about the increasing Chinese military power and even some of the proclamations from some high-ranking U.S. representatives. Um, could you explain what are actually the main factors that make sure that the likelihood of the Chinese invasion being a success is so low and what makes the U.S. slash Taiwanese position so strong? We were a little surprised about the outcome also because we had seen many of these comments from participants in other war games, particularly classified war games in uh, the Department of Defense. But there were a couple of reasons why we got the results that we did. The primary one is that conducting an amphibious assault is extremely difficult. It is arguably the most difficult of military operations because you have to build up your combat power on a hostile shore from zero, and you are very exposed during that time period. The other thing is that Taiwan is a very difficult island to conquer. It has the center section, which is very mountainous and very difficult to traverse. The coastal plains have a lot of cities and rivers that make them easily defended. So conquering uh, Taiwan, occupying it is very difficult. I've heard um, on that note that um... Basically, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, if it were to happen, would be one of the most difficult military operations in history and probably the most difficult amphibious uh, operation that has ever been conducted. I think that might go a little far because uh, there have been many uh, uh, very difficult, very challenging amphibious operations, but it would be right up there with uh, D-Day, the... Uh, invasion of Europe in 1944 with uh, the invasion of Okinawa in the Pacific or the Philippines. Uh, it's extremely difficult. And because it's of a, that scale and that level of difficulty, that's one of the reasons that the Chinese have such a difficult time. I guess, I'm not sure if you took that into account, but one of the arguments that often is uh, used um, as a factor that might be going against the Chinese uh, success in this case is that China's military actually haven't had combat experience in uh, more than five decades. Um, did you take that into a factor and do you think that would play a role or is that sort of an overestimated argument? Well, it's certainly an important consideration. In our base case, that is the most likely, we ascribed to all combat units, the capabilities that they were supposed to have. So Chinese ground units that invaded Taiwan you know, had the same capabilities essentially as the United States, as did the Taiwanese. But we ran several excursions where that was not the case because we recognized that the Chinese might not have developed their amphibious doctrine uh, to the level of the United States in, say, World War II. Uh, and they might not have achieved the same level of readiness that the United States has achieved. Uh, when we ran those excursions, uh, the outcomes were even worse for the, the, the Chinese. It was extremely difficult uh, to get ashore. When they did get ashore, uh, they were not able to build up their combat power and uh, were decisively defeated. 
One other thing that I was thinking about when reading the um, uh, the, the report was all the factors that might not uh, be uh, open to public. So what I'm thinking of is either sometimes there are speculations that the, for example, the Chinese military budget is actually a lot bigger than um, uh, what they say it is, or that their military capabilities might be um, uh, greater than uh, they're willing to show. That could be one. On the other hand, one other thing that I've seen as a speculation is a possibility that um, one of the two sides might, in the moment of an invasion, come out with um, sort of some sort of a classified technology that has not been previously publicly revealed and that might turn out to be a game changer in, in, in the conflict. Yeah, let me go back for one second to your original question about the surprising results. There were two uh, additional considerations about why the Chinese had such a difficult time. One of them is that they were conducting an invasion. And because of the in invasion, their fleet was tethered to Taiwan and protecting the am amphibious ships. And as a result, they were very vulnerable to U.S. attacks, a scenario where they were not trying to uh, invade Taiwan, but were pushing back U.S. military and coalition partners. Uh, that might look quite different. The other insight is that when we briefed these results around the Pentagon, and we did that extensively, the feedback we got from people was that this, this seemed to be about right. It was consistent with their expectations, despite what might have uh, leaked out into the press. In particular, there was one analyst who's been very widely quoted about how the United States gets clobbered in a war with Taiwan, uh, with China over Taiwan. Uh, when that person played the game, uh, they said, yep, this, this feels about right, about what I would expect. So I think that there's some difference between the public perception of what DOD war games are showing and uh, what, in fact, their results are. So do you think that the U.S. military and the DOD are sort of, in their public proclamations, making their situation seem to be worse than they actually think that it would be in case of a conflict? I don't think it's intentional, but I think it's a function of the scenarios that they use. They tend to use pessimistic scenarios, and they also tend to look at the first couple of days of combat when U.S. losses are very high. Uh, we used a variety of scenarios, and we were in the game for the equivalent of about three or four weeks. And by the third or fourth week, uh, the United States and the coalition are doing a lot better. They're receiving reinforcements that Chinese have been heavily uh, traded. I think on that note, uh, we're talking about the war games that are being played in, in Washington, and that might uh, yield to have similar results as yours. But I guess even more important is the question of the war games that are for sure being played in Beijing and China. Um, do you think, I guess it's complete speculation, but would you say that if the Chinese would play the similar war games of their own, would they reach uh, same conclusions? Well, it's very hard to say what a Chinese war game might look like or what their conclusions might be. We do know that they are familiar with our game and the results. Uh, we have talked to some groups from China. We've heard from various contacts in the U.S. government that this a war game was briefed at the highest levels in the Chinese government. So they know what we came out with and what the reasons were be behind that. I guess the reason I'm asking is that if both sides would conduct a war game before a conflict was about to happen and both sides would find out that the result is basically pretty clear, um, then you would think that there is no chance that the conflict would ever play out if one of the sides clearly knows that it's going to lose. Well, you would think that. Uh, but, of course, there's always some element of uncertainty and some uh, you know, possibility of a better outcome. And sometimes countries will launch attacks even when the prospects are not that good. 
Uh, a classic example of that is the Japanese in World War II. Uh, the Japanese knew that they were outclassed by the United States and that what they were doing was extremely risky, uh, but they felt that they had to do it because of the squeeze on their economy and their desire to expand. So they launched an attack, even recognizing uh, the great risks that were involved. And of course, as it turned out, uh, it was a very unwise thing to do and it cost uh, Japan heavily, but they had done it anyway. Uh, so one does hope that both sides will do the war gaming and uh, that that will uh, deter them. But we also know that sometimes countries will move forward. Now, on a more optimistic note uh, about war gaming by both sides, I think during the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union did a lot of war gaming about what a nuclear exchange might look like. And both of them came to the conclusion that this was uh, a very uh, horrible outcome and that they needed to uh, avoid it if at all possible. And as a result, their behavior during the Cold War tended to be quite cautious because they were aware of the risks. I guess that is completely true. But I guess on the other hand, while I think the U.S. might tend to um, underestimate intentionally or unintentionally their own capabilities when it's simulating certain scenarios, I would imagine that China or authoritarian uh, states in general might tend to overestimate their capabilities for um, political reasons, because as it happens in these regimes and in their militaries, often uh, no one wants to be the bearer of bad news. Um, so things might seem uh, better than uh, they are in, in, in reality. I think that Ukraine and the wrong intelligence assessment that Russia had before the invasion is a good example of that. And I was, I'm wondering if in these sort of war games and simulations, um, this might be the case, that the Chinese military might overestimate their own capabilities prior to it simply because uh, they don't want to seem incompetent to their uh, political leadership. And that's certainly possible. Authoritarian regimes, I think every regime, uh, you know, tends to want to give good news to the top leadership. On the other hand, I, militaries tend to be quite conservative and very aware of their own weaknesses and vulnerabilities and have a tendency to overestimate their opponents. What frequently happens in authoritarian regimes is that the political dimension will trump the military estimates. In other words, the military might say that you know, the prospects for military victory look poor, but the political uh, establishment says, yes, but we are doing things on the political side uh, that will uh, obviate the uh, military of effects. You see that uh, the Second World War, you know, Hitler and his generals, the generals were always very pessimistic. Hitler kept on saying um, essentially that, you know, he had the pol political side uh, in hand. I think that happened with uh, Saddam Hussein. His generals were telling him that the United States would defeat them. And Saddam Hussein kept saying, no, he was working with the French and the Russians uh, to deter the United States. Um, I think if we can um, talk about the uh, recommendations that you make, because I think they're uh, quite interesting. What do you think, based on the war game, uh, what were the main takeaways and lessons and recommendations that you gave for policymakers and military planners in Washington? Let me back up for one second. It's important to note that we are not predicting that a war will occur. What we argue is that given Chinese rhetoric and the military buildup, a war is plausible. And we recognize that wars happen for a wide variety of reasons that outsiders might think are uh, unwise. Sometimes countries will misestimate the uh, military balance. They'll misestimate the will of their adversaries. They will feel that Domestic political pressures are pushing them to uh, launch a, a war. There are a whole variety of reasons why countries might go to war. Uh, and that's why we felt that it was worthwhile looking at uh, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. In addition, we argued that invasion is the most dangerous course of action. So it was plausible and the most dangerous. That's why we, we looked at it. But we recognized that 
this might not be the most likely. Many people argued that, for instance, blockade might be more likely. We didn't disagree with that. Um, and that an invasion might be unwise, and we didn't uh, disagree with that either, only that an invasion was plausible and most dangerous. To get to your question on recommendations, uh, we had four major insights, and then we had a large number of uh, detailed recommendations. The first major insight is the importance of Japan, and because without those bases, the U.S. fighter attack fleet uh, is useless. There's no place to base them where they can get into the fight. Guam is too far away, and getting them onto Taiwan before the war is unlikely because of the political situation. So if the United States can't use its bases in Japan, uh, then this fight becomes extremely difficult and essentially almost impossible for the United States. Uh, we did look at uh, some of those scenarios and uh, they did not come out very well. Now our base scenario, uh, our base assumption was that the Japanese would allow the United States to use its bases, but that the Japanese military forces would not become involved unless the Chinese attacked uh, the Japanese mainland. And we tested that with a large number of senior Japanese officials and felt comfortable that that was a, a reasonable assumption. A second insight was that a Ukrainian strategy was not possible. And by that, we meant that in the war between Ukraine and Russia, the United States and Europe and others have been able to send supplies to Ukraine as the war has gone on. The Russians have tried to interdict that flow, but they have not been successful in doing that. So the United States and partners have flowed large amounts of equipment and supplies and munitions to Ukraine. That's not possible in a conflict uh, with China over Taiwan. The Chinese defensive bubble over Taiwan is so powerful that nothing can get through. Uh, on several of the games, we had U.S. players who tried to send in convoys or uh, airlift, and it always failed. They were uh, destroyed. So Taiwan needs to have everything uh, to fight for the first month or two already on hand when the conflict begins, because we can't get that into them once the conflict starts, at least for the first uh, month or two. There were two other insights that came out. One is that the Taiwanese have to fight. There's a lot of debate about whether they will do that and the quality of their armed forces. We did vary the quality of the Taiwanese armed forces in several of the scenarios, but they all assume that the Taiwanese government will resist. If it doesn't, then all of this is uh, overcome by events. It's also true that it's impossible to know ahead of time what the nature of the Taiwanese resistance will be. Some people argue that the Taiwanese government has been penetrated by uh, the Chinese communists and that it will collapse, uh, that the population is not ready for a difficult struggle. On the other hand, other people point to Ukraine and argue that when the fighting begins and an invasion starts, that the population will rally. It's impossible to know ahead of time, uh, and we therefore flag that as a, a key assumption. The other thing is that the United States needs to engage from the very beginning. The United States waits, say, a week to make a decision about getting involved. That just gives China more time to get established ashore uh, and makes the fight much more difficult. Beyond that, we made recommendations in a variety of areas. Uh, there are probably too many uh, to walk through individually, uh, but let me highlight a couple of them. For politics and strategy, for example, we note the key assumption about whether the United States will strike the Chinese homeland. We found that when we talked to people in the Pentagon, they said, absolutely, that's part of our, our plan. When we talked to people in the White House and the State Department, they said that they would be reluctant uh, to do that because of the risk of nuclear escalation. Uh, it, we don't make a recommendation about which way to go, but we do recommend that the United States come to some sort of conclusion before the war begins, rather than trying to thrash that out uh, once the war has started. Another key assumption 
that was unclear when we talked uh, to people in the Pentagon was whether the United States would be able to move troops onto Taiwan. Uh, the Marine Corps assumes that they can. Uh, they have built uh, some special units to take on the Chinese fleet, and their assumption is that they will be able to move those units forward before the war begins to get them in position uh, to counter the, the Chinese. Many other people argue that that is not possible, that any move to put U.S. troops onto Taiwan during a crisis will precipitate the conflict that we're trying to avoid. And again, we say this needs to be threshed out ahead of time, not while the conflict is going on. Another element is the recognition of high casualties that will occur in this kind of conflict, particularly for the Navy and the Air Force, which have operated essentially in sanctuary since uh, the Korean War. They would be very exposed and take casualties that they have not sustained uh, again since the Second World War. The leadership recognizes this. When you listen to their uh, top leaders, they all note how a great power conflict would be different from the conflicts that have occurred since the end of the Cold War uh, and that the service needs to be ready for that. But it's one thing to say that and then quite another for the organization uh, to assimilate it, particularly since the experience of military personnel, particularly those who have been in the service for a while at sort of mid and senior levels, their experience is with counterinsurgency and regional conflicts like with uh, Iraq uh, and not with great power conflict. So when they think about conflict, their personal experience is not consistent with what a great power conflict might look like. Uh, one illustration we make is for the Air Force that when follow-on uh, waves of fighter attack aircraft arrive at uh, Okinawa, forward air base there. Uh, they will land on a bumpy runway because it has been cratered several times by Chinese missiles. They will taxi past literally hundreds of wrecked aircraft that were destroyed on the ground by these missile attacks. Uh, they would move into barracks that had been vacated by the previous squadron because it, it was wiped out uh, previously. Uh, the hospitals would be full of wounded. The golf course would be turned into a cemetery and they would be told Welcome to Okinawa. Tomorrow you fly over Taiwan. And that's an experience they have not had since the Second World War. The final item is the question about porcupine strategies and asymmetric capabilities. The Taiwanese Air Force and surface ships get destroyed early on because of the massive uh, Chinese firepower that they bring to bear we make to the Taiwanese is that the balanced forces that they've built over the last 70 years since leaving the mainland, that is, you know, an army, an air force with um, fighter aircraft and a navy with surface ships, that served them well for about 50 years when the Chinese capabilities in the air and at sea were weak. But now that the Chinese have built their military capabilities, the Taiwanese cannot compete. And we recommend, like many people, that they put more emphasis on what are called asymmetric capabilities. That's land-based air defense, uh, land-based anti-ship missiles, uh, sea mines, and, and the like. Now, we do note that although an asymmetric capability is best for a invasion scenario, a full-out conflict, these other capabilities, surface ships, aircraft are very useful in other kinds of competition with the Chinese. For example, the, many times they test the uh, Taiwanese defenses. So we recognize that uh, Taiwan will probably need a balanced capability, but leaning more heavily uh, in the future on these asymmetric uh, uh, weapons. So I have a number of follow-up questions on many of these recommendations. Um, one of them is uh, the fact that you mentioned that the United States casualties, just as the Chinese ones, would be at a rate that is basically unprecedented since uh, World War II, at least. And I was wondering, uh, you've mentioned that 
theoretically, the U.S. Uh, military leadership is prepared for that. But would you say that the U.S. public opinion and the U.S. political leadership is prepared for anything like that? Because the, at the end of the day, the military is governed by the political side of things, and that is governed by the public opinion, as it often happens. Well, it's clear the public is not prepared for this because you know, their experience in the last 25 years for a generation has been, um, their experience over the last 25 years, an entire generation, is with regional conflicts that do not produce high casualties. Now, they produce some, and each one of them is a, a tragedy, but not the massive casualties that would occur in a great power conflict. It's very hard to say what the effect of that would be uh, on the conflict itself. On the one hand, one thing about the timeline on the game is that for three or four weeks, it's unlikely that public opinion would have an effect because it often takes time for the public to affect its representatives and for those representatives then to affect military decision making. We do assume that the Chinese have instigated this conflict and that, therefore, uh, that makes it more like a, a situation like World War II, where we are attacked, we take a lot of casualties, and that would uh, act to strengthen U.S. resolve. You could imagine other scenarios where that uh, might not be the case. And it's hard to say what the public's reaction would be. I think if, if it played out as we established, that is, the Chinese attack, I think is a high likelihood the U.S. population would support vigorous countermeasures and a war. Uh, we saw that, of course, in the Second World War. And we saw it in um, the Civil War, you know, where the expectation early on had been for relatively low casualties, and then it turned out to be a conflict with very heavy casualties. But both sides uh, sustained that and kept, kept going. Uh, one other recommendation that I thought was really interesting is specifically for um, uh, the, the the U.S. Air Force, and that that given the high rate of casualties in in both manpower and but also equipment, the strategy should be to start procure, procuring more cheaper um, equipment, but. That somehow seems to be the opposite of how, in the recent decades, the U.S. Air Force and sort of the U.S. military has operated when it tended to um, buy and develop sort of more and more expensive uh, technology and equipment in fewer and fewer numbers. But for a great power conflict such as the invasion of Taiwan, the strategy that would be needed is actually the opposite. And I was wondering, based on your experience and also your conversations with people from the DOD and Pentagon, if you do you think that this recommendation is being reflected and if the uh, giant of the U.S. Uh, defense industry and military is moving in that direction? Uh, well, not surprisingly, this recommendation got a lot of attention from the U.S. Air Force. Uh, when we briefed their senior leadership, they were quite supportive of most of the war game, but of course they did not uh, accept that particular recommendation. And we recognize that that kind of decision involves many, many factors way beyond what uh, we looked at in this project. But we did want to raise the question of the high cost and small numbers of aircraft that the United States was procuring, given that 90% of U.S. aircraft losses occurred on the ground. What is the point of building a sixth generation fighter for two hundred million dollars if ninety percent of them will be destroyed on the on the ground uh, and not have a chance to use all those capabilities uh, in the air? So we wanted to put that question on the table uh, to start discussion. And as you point out, it is the opposite of where the u s. Air Force has been going for many decades. I don't see any changes in their behavior making a change like that would take a, a lot of time and effort. I do hope that they maybe keep some of the legacy aircraft around a little longer, uh, and, and that might give them the kind of numbers uh, that they would need uh, in a conflict like this, given the high casualties. Did you um, 
account for any other allies that the U.S. might have, or, apart from Japan. Sometimes there are speculations that Australia, the U.K., um, maybe the Philippines, some other regional states, France even, might uh, join in in some capacities. Did you take that into an account? And if yes, did it play any role at all? Or is it just sort of negligible involvement, if any? We did run a variety of scenarios with different coalitions. Uh, we looked, for example, at the Philippines. Now, when we did the original analysis, it was right after the Marcos uh, government took power and after Duarte, where there was a lot of skepticism about uh, alliances with the United States and flirtation with China. So our base assumption was that the Philippines would be neutral. We did look at the Philippines allowing U.S. to position forces before the war. For example, some of these Marine, uh, what are called littoral regiments. And that was useful. Uh, they would be put on islands uh, north of Luzon where they could attack the Chinese fleet. The problem for those units is that they could not be resupplied, that the Chinese defensive bubble over uh, these units prevented ships and aircraft from getting in there and resupplying them. So they would fire off all of their existing missiles uh, and then were unable to uh, do more. We, we assume that the Philippines would not participate with their own armed forces. You know, they are uh, quite uh, weak compared to the, uh, the Chinese. Uh, the South Koreans, we assumed that they would not participate. They've said that they would not participate, that they would hold their forces back to keep an eye on North Korea. We did assume that the United States could take half of its aircraft, two squadrons, out of uh, South Korea to, to use in the conflict. We assumed that other countries would remain neutral. Uh, Vietnam, for example, in the uh, Singapore, Singapore would let us use our facilities there, but that they would participate themselves. Australia, we assume that they did participate, uh, that they allowed the U.S. to use basing in Australia, but they're quite far from Taiwan. And our assumption was that they would use their capabilities in the South China Sea because at the same time that there was conflict going on around Taiwan, the U.S. is bringing ships from the Atlantic through the South China Sea, and there's a separate conflict going on there, which we did not simulate. The question about Europe was really moot. Most people didn't really believe that the Europeans would send the forces, uh, that they might participate in sanctions, which would be very helpful. But in any case, it would just take too long for any European forces to get to the Western Pacific. To sail a task force might take uh, 30 or 60 days, for example, and our game did not run that long. So uh, it was a, a moot question. I did joke with the UK uh, Naval Planning Group that by the time the Queen Elizabeth battle group arrived in the Western Pacific, the US and Chinese would have sunk each other's aircraft carriers. So the battle group would be the most powerful force, naval force in the Western Pacific and Britannia would once again rule the waves. They, they enjoyed that. I think that the, the final um, segment that I'd like to talk about is sort of um, uh, the uh, what happens after your game ends. Uh, because uh, in the war game that you've played, there was sort of a limited scenario that, it, that only ran for three or four weeks. Um, and my feeling when reading the report was that the expectation is that it would be a short, very intense, but short war, at the end of which one side would be um, defeated with most of its um, navy destroyed, and that side would probably be China, and that would uh, end the conflict, and that neither side would want to um, continue. And I think that that is definitely an option, but I guess then uh, there's the other option that instead of a uh, change in political regime in China or some kind of a ceasefire, it would lead to a 
further escalation and mobilization from Chinese side and perhaps um, opening up even a, a larger theater um, in the region, maybe attacking somewhere else and sort of escalating it into something, into a much more um, prolonged and perhaps a greater conflict. And I was wondering if you had uh, that in mind um, and how, how does that figure in your calculations and perhaps of those uh, planners that you spoke at in DOD? Yeah, those are, are great questions. Oh, and they came up when we played the game. Many people argued that blockade might be more likely than invasion. People raised questions about the use of nuclear weapons and then also how the war might end and whether it would, in fact, not end but continue for a long period of time. The history of these things, as we're seeing in Ukraine, is that even after one side has been stalemated, they often don't stop. We recognize those are all great questions. Now, we have follow-on projects to look at nuclear operations and blockades. Uh, we'd love to do a follow-on to look at a long war, what would happen if the war went on for six months or a year, because the dynamics, as we're seeing in Ukraine, become quite different as top-line equipment becomes less available and uh, militaries have to use other equipment and improvisations. So those are great questions, uh, and we hope to have at least some answers in about a year. Okay. Um, I think my final question would be, um, I, I went to Taiwan about two months ago on sort of a study trip um, when we, uh, when I've had the chance to meet a lot of representatives from the government, from the uh, academia, think tanks, um, civil sector, and to get a sort of a feeling for, for, for the situation, I was asking almost everyone I've met, what is their personal take? And if they had to make a guess on what is going to happen, um, what would it be? So I'm going to ask you the same question uh, to end with. And I know it's a pure speculation and no one can know, but if you had to make a guess, on whether China will attempt a, an invasion in the next, let's say, by the end of the decade, um, given everything you know, given your experience, and given the, the war game that you've played and seen, um, what would you be your answer? Uh, I would, and this is my personal answer, not uh, the uh, project's answer, I would say that chances are in the 20 to 30% and what that means is that it's worth hedging against. It's not probable, uh, but because it's possible and the impact would be so devastating for both Taiwan and the United States and the coalition, it's worth hedging against and reinforcing deterrence. The other thing I would note is that I've briefed this study, the results to many audiences, uh, including Taiwanese groups, uh, I group I, I briefed a group of Taiwanese young professionals. So these are 30 ish uh, young people. And I asked the question, do a poll. Do you think these results are plausible or do you think that Taiwan would do better or worse? Now, most said they thought that this was plausible, but there was a large minority that said that Taiwan would do worse. When I briefed it to senior Taiwanese military and government officials, uh, they also said this looked about right, most likely. But a large minority said they thought that Taiwan would do better. So there's a generation gap uh, between the uh, uh, older Taiwanese in the government uh, and younger Taiwanese. I guess we'll have to see what happens. But thank you so much. That was an extremely interesting conversation. Uh, and I would highly recommend uh, the report of the war game that we were talking about uh, to read uh, to everyone. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And it's probably the only publicly available report uh, of its kind. So, Mark, uh, thank you so much for the, taking the time and, and talking to me. Sure. And let me add one more thing, building on what you just said. The reason the report got so much attention uh, is for three reasons. The first is that we used a lot of historical data, weapons testing data, to come up with the combat results tables. It was not a case of 
subject matter experts in the back room making their professional judgment. It was done objectively. The rules for the first game were the same as the rules for the 25th game. The second is that we used unclassified data. So we could be very specific about what our assumptions were and what the results were. We didn't have to say U.S. lost lots of airplanes. We could specify how many under the different uh, circumstances. So the war game and its results have been uh, widely published. And the third thing is that we ran it 25 times. Many war games look at a U.S.-China conflict, but they'll be run once, maybe twice. By running it 25 times, we could look at a wide variety of strategies and scenarios. We also have a wide variety of players uh, who took different approaches. So for all three reasons, uh, this project got a tremendous amount of attention. And it was well-deserved, I would say. Thank you so much.